Hi, Mickey. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Uh, I'm doing fine, um, although I'm expecting the gas man to come to fix my furnace, so... That could provide some drama. That could provide some drama. We better get this in before he shows up. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I think we can keep the tape rolling if he does show up. It would it be kind be, of like um, Borat, you know? Could be like Borat. It could be like Jonah Goldberg's dog. Kind of like that. One of our greatest hits. Or Matt Iglesias' dog, which uh, barked throughout the dialogue uh, involving his roommate, Spencer Ackerman. Um, okay. But anyway, so who knows? It's wild and crazy. Anything could happen. Anything could, that's why they flock. That's why they flock to see us, Mickey. It's like Howard Stern. A lot like that, give or, give or take seven decimal points. Um, so we were going to start off on a cultural note, on a kind of a back-of-the-book note. Yes. Since there's finally been a cultural event worthy of our uh, recognition, which is the movie Worthy Borat. of your attention, Bob. I'm, you're the one who lives a priestly life of solitude and contemplation. Every once in a while, I'd come out of the monastery. And what did you do when you were out of the monastery? I went to see the movie Borat. And? Well, uh, first of all, I have to admit that I did, I did laugh repeatedly. Um, but it's possible to laugh at something and not entirely approve of it. The movie Pulp Fiction comes to mind where you I was... Take the, do you take the, the David Brooks, their condescending toward ordinary Americans line? Well, no. I mean, th there may be a little of that, but I think Brooks, Brooks's column is what convinced me to go, that, that I should go see it and we should talk about it. You've seen it, right? I have seen it. Um, I, saw, I saw a preview, Bob, because I'm... One of the Hollywood elite. Yeah. Who else was there? Anybody of note? A bunch of Russians. It was weird. Well, that gets at an interesting question, actually. Um, because when I first heard just about it and that there was this, this reaction against it in Kazakhstan, my first reaction was, you know, I'm not sure that what the world most needs right now is a very conspicuous example of a Jewish guy making fun of a Muslim nation as backwards. But... Then when I saw the movie, it's not so, it's actually not entirely clear to me what the guy, what the character's ethnic background is supposed to be. Of course, he, he's supposed to be from Kazakhstan. And ethnic Kazakhs, the indigenous people of Kazakhstan, are mainly Muslims. But there are also these, uh, you know, Slavs, I guess, Ukrainians and Russians who came in during the Soviet era. Uh, and, are, and are not Muslims. I mean, what could, did you, could you figure out what exactly his ethnic profile is supposed to be in this movie? Well, I certainly didn't. I assumed he was a Slav or a Ukrainian. I, I, I certainly didn't think he was a Muslim. There was nothing, nothing conspicuous. No, although at the end there's some remark Islamic about how as a result of going to America, his village has become Christian or something, and he would already be a Christian, right? If Anyway. Oh, I didn't get that part, but... Also, the, the Brooks said something, uh, or, or Joel Stein in the L.A. Times said he made fun of anti-Muslim hatred, which I missed. No, he did at one point, and that was what surprised me, and I think that's what, what is to, to his credit. I mean, one, 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 the one criticism of Brooks' is I agree with is that I don't think he should have structured the thing around anti-Semitism and kind of gone out to find it. That, that was the stuff that I didn't think was especially funny. Uh, and I suspect that he worked hard to kind of dig it up because you could tell from the way they shot the scenes in, you know, supposedly in Kazakhstan, that it was built into the, the idea from the beginning in a big way, the anti-Semitism, that, that these, you know, people in Kazakhstan are anti-Semites and he's going to go find an America and so on. Um, but it's true, to his credit, when he did find uh, an example of anti-Muslim bigotry, it did emerge. It was the guy he was talking to right before the rodeo who said, uh, you know, that mustache makes you look like a Muslim. You're not a Muslim, are you? And he says, no. And the guy says, we should shave it. Cause, you know, and, and he goes on and on the guy, about how, how he doesn't like Muslims. I must admit, I, 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 I like the movie. And first, because all the, the sort of making fun of, of, of unwitting rubes was, was very toned down. He didn't, you know... It, well, that's the word Brooks uses, that he's making fun of of rubes, and it's the smart people against the rubes. That's actually not at all the case in the movie, I'd say. I mean, a lot of the people that he's putting on do not fit the description of a rube. But anyway, sorry, go ahead. And it was, it was, it was also, you know, the, the um, it had this sort of sweet story sort of running through it, of this guy running around with a chicken in his suitcase and his, and his crazy minder and the beer in the back of his truck, and 
It, it seems to me you, just you're a sucker for mammalian props. I know. I'm a sucker for like appreciation of absurd, wacky situations, and I thought even some of the what supposedly is the making fun of Americana, like where he's singing at the rodeo, was just like a, making fun of absurd situations. I even thought the anti-Semitism was so, so crazy and, and sort of unrelated to reality that it became its own comic shtick. Well, no, but he did. Uh, I mean, I mean, nobody could seriously believe that anti-Semitism was the per, a pervasive fact of American life. Well, I don't know. I think that would be the superficial interpretation because he finds a couple of people who either who either say things or or you know go along with his with his anti-Semitism. Well, but he pro, you know he prods it. That's his comic shtick. Is that you know he buys a gun and he said, "Could I use this to kill Jews?" But the guy doesn't volunteer that. He just and a lot of the things where people are supposedly embarrassing themselves, they're just playing along, like John Murtha being offered a bribe, you know? Well, the frat boy, the drunk frat boy seems to volunteer an anti-Semitic remark. I suspect that if you looked at the complete videotape, and in this age of transparency, why doesn't uh, Sasha Baron Cohen, you know, put some of the unedited stuff up there for us to inspect uh, and, and evaluate his integrity on the basis of um, I, I think you would you would find that he had probably spent a lot of time establishing his own character as anti-Semitic to draw the fra that that part of the frat very, boy out. Uh, very good point. And, I'll, and also, if, if a gun owner had said, "Kill Jews," what are you, some kind of racist? Get out of my store! Oh uh, yeah, that that stuff was on the editing room floor. They wouldn't have shown that part. But also, right? I, I actually thought I, I wasn't convinced the gun owner uh, understood him. If if you look at how kind of quick the utterance was that the, that the gun owner responded to. But anyway, uh, the gun but, store owner. Um, but it, it, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. If you're looking, I mean, it, I thought Brooks was, uh, was off base because it was a, if you really want cheap anti-American, sort of odious anti-American sort of making fun of the rubes, look at the, at the movie Hearts and Minds, which is an anti-war movie uh, where they basically say, you know, the reason we're in Vietnam is the same reason these idiot middle Americans root for football teams. And there's a lot of, like, shots of mindless Americans cheering with pom-poms, and you're supposed to laugh at them. It's one of the most offensive movies I've ever seen. And it's so much worse than anything in Borat. Uh, it, 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 there's just no comparison. Well, I still, I mean, one thing I would say about, of course, Brooks's critique is, you know, it's this kind of right-wing populism coming out, and he's offended that you would that you would uh, make fun of kind of the grassroots uh, people who constitute the red state, you know, constituency. Um, I, I think, first of all, in a characteristically nationalist fashion, Brooks doesn't mention at all the group of people who, it seems to me, have the the best, the strongest grievance of all, which is the people of Kazakhstan, right? I mean, that is, and this gets at one critique of the anti-Semitism, which is, you know, he claims, Cohen claims that, that he was doing something serious in the way of anti-Semitism. He's given, given an interview on this and then wanted to explore the roots of anti-Semitism. Well, try to convince me that what he does to the people of Kazakhstan is not the rough equivalent of anti-Semitism. It, it's, it's this blatant, bigoted stereotyping. Uh, and you can say it's all it's all a joke, but if it's all a joke, the whole movie's a joke. I mean, uh, and maybe it is, but, but but the point is, you know, he claims he was seriously looking, uh, taking a look at anti-Semitism. How is it any worse to take a whole nationality of people and depict them as stereotypically backward and stupid? Or how is it not worse? What did I say? I thought that was I thought that was the humor in the piece is that it violates the PC taboo against making fun of other cultures. And say that you know this culture is well, just fine, like but you can't have it both ways. Idiotic. You can't say this is a high-minded exploration of the evils of anti-Semitism, of that kind of bigotry, and then say, but the, but all the other kinds of bigotry are just a joke. No, no, he shouldn't be high-minded at all. He, the, the joke is just he picked a random country and made fun of it. Well, he 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 is high-minded, and I, what he says is uh, the the thesis he claims to have been exploring was the thesis that anti-Semitism may not be the problem so much as apathy, and, and particularly in, in Germany in World War II. He says he's, he's taken by the thesis that it wasn't so much active anti-Semitism on the part of, of Germany. You know, the, the, the only thing that's necessary for evil to triumph is that good people do nothing or whatever. That it was indifference right. to the anti-Semitism. But 
That's not that's not my my. That's my not my read. Line. If he really wanted to show us that, he would show us the. 60 seconds before that frat boy's utterance, when he himself, I am almost sure, is advertising his own anti-Semitism and draws the guy into it. Uh, right. Um, I, uh, the other thing is, with the tour of like the South and the state, kind of, that is the classic foreign correspondence tour of America. Is is you know, if you're a foreign correspondent, you go out to find the, the stupidest, not the stupidest, but the most colorfully uh, provincial parts of America, and you head down to the south, and you look at for snake handlers and people talking in tongues and rodeos, and so it wasn't, you know, necessarily that he, he didn't make fun of, you know, Starbucks drinking latte sipping bobos. He did his... make fun of some of them. Remember the feminists? Right, exactly. That's the other flaw in Brooks' speech. Exactly. Well, oh, there are a lot of... He, he, he claims you know, that he... it's all rubes. I mean... First right. of all, on the one hand, he says there's Southern Gentry included in his list of targets, and then he says they're all rubes. Well, Southern Gentry aren't rubes, and those people around the dinner table, and I guess it was Dallas or something, were not stupid, you know. Uh, and, in fact, they didn't come off all that badly, and a number of people actually don't come off that badly in the movie. Right. Well, that's the point of it, about it's not, not as vicious as... as, as it, it's just not vicious at all, really. But I just think uh, the thing where, you know... Uh, he starts out by depicting the people of Kazakhstan as anti-Semitic big time and having this running of the Jews thing as one of their, you know, traditions. And then he goes out and tries to flesh that out. I really thought that was superfluous and, and, and needlessly mean. It was the stuff I didn't laugh at, and I don't understand the, the purpose of it because or the need for it because the other stuff was so funny. Um, and uh, it's not like he needed that to get the attention. So but I kind of totally don't get it. I don't know. I thought it was his thing, and it's so quirky and eccentric that it it, it was fine. Uh, I mean, I have I also have I have a larger kind of ethical problem with it. I mean, like I said, it, it reminded me of Pulp Fiction, at least in the sense that I thought a lot of it was really funny and 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 really you know showed a, a kind of genius, and yet I was uncomfortable with the kind of with, with kind of the, the moral tenor of the humor and thought that ultimately something like Pulp Fiction exerts a bad influence on culture. P part of my problem, I mean, I've already told you why I think, you know, various reasons I think this is bad, uh, particularly at this, uh, this moment in history, but also the whole business of the whole business of the put-on, okay, when, when you you have fun at people's expense by putting them under the, leaving them under the impression that something is going on that totally is not going on. It seems to me that can be acceptable, but the, the litmus test question is, can you get them to sign the release forms after it happens, or do you have to get them to sign the release forms before it happens, okay? Like on Canon Camera, Okay, it's true that because of the structure of Canon Camera, they could only get the people to sign the release forms after, right? But, uh, but by the same token, that provided a filter so that it was only relatively benign stuff that would make it through because it had to be that the people looked at it and said, yeah, this is okay. I think that's a good test. Well, and they I, don't have to look at it before they sign the release. They can just sign the release and, and not realize how bad they come off. Well, okay, but that still is different from getting some frat boys to sign a release form and then getting them some modestly drunken frat boys to sign a release form, then get them completely drunk, <laughs> right, and then run away and say, we've got the release form. I'm almost surprised that those things hold up in court because you know that they lied. Uh, they probably avoided putting lies on the release forms themselves, but they had to, they, uh, they definitely in some cases lied fundamentally to the people. You know, those well, people at that, da at that dinner table had been lied to about what was going on. We don't know whether they'll hold up in court, but I didn't think the humor of that depended on it being a reality show. See, I thought I, I hate humor where they call call people in and make fun of them. I even hate, I even don't like sort of Larry David humor where it's fictional but it's based on ever more excruciating situations. That's not my idea of a good time. But uh, but but this it sort of just didn't it didn't really depend on it being real. I mean those could, those the frat boys could. Could have been entirely actors. It didn't matter. It was just a wacky, funny, sweet situation. It, it's hard to say. I mean, it did remind you, kind of in the way the movie Blair Witch Project reminded you, how bad most Hollywood acting was. Because 
this had an authenticity, the way people were really reacting to things. This had, a, and, and you know, Blair Witch Project was different, but it was, it, was, it was heavily improvised, even though the people knew they were on camera. But right. in both cases, it, it reminded you that scripted Hollywood stuff usually produces really ultimately inauthentic acting, and it would have been very hard to get acting as good as this inadvertent acting on the part of the people who were being duped, I think. Well, right, but that doesn't... But that, that's a very good point, but that, that, that just means that, uh, you know, this may be a better way to get acting out of people. It doesn't mean that, the, that it depends on I, it being real. I think real. a certain amount of the humor real. I, I mean, a good example is when, the, when a, after the nude wrestling scene, the two guys run nude onto the stage of some conference or convention. Right. Would that have been funny, Mickey? I don't think so. In a feature film, that's like a yawn, if you don't think it's really happening. Well, that's true. Although the the whole dude wrestling th scene, which which I thought went on too long, but I, I was laughing maniacally through it, would that have nothing to do with reality? And the and and the bear scene, which was the highlight of the movie for me. For I mean, you, yeah. How could you top that? That was obviously <laughs> the, the bear. I don't I don't think the bear really scared a bunch of little children. I think the children were actors. Oh, I'm not sure. Now, presumably, okay. the black prostitute was an actress, right? Or an actor, as they say. I assume did. so, although I have some doubts about that. And also, you know, Pam Anderson, that, that thing was... That had to be rigged, yeah. But the, so, that was still funny. Now, the bear head in the refrigerator, that was a laugh riot. But we don't want to spoil the thing. Thought and I the car that. buying scene, let's face it, was... I mean, the frat boy in us both is just coming out now. I'm sorry. I, my, I just have not evolved since I was 17. But... He, and and this, is a, this is another problem with Brooks' thesis. I mean, he acts as if this movie is like East Coast elites laughing at, 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 at red state yokels. Who do you think was getting the biggest guffaws out of that car dealer scene, Mickey? Right? What was the car dealer scene? I forgot. You've forgotten a car dealer scene? I've forgotten it. Mickey, you've forgotten the moral of that story? The magnet is the vehicle itself, Mickey? You've forgotten that? Mickey? It was something. I that thought you would have. That would have been your take-home lesson, totally. But given your interest in cars and related matters, he was convincing him that the. Don't, you may not want to finish that sentence on uh, family TV. He was convincing him that a, a postal vehicle was a chick magnet. Oh, I, uh, I, I missed this. We'll leave. That's shocking. Well, speaking of which, well, maybe. Maybe I saw an expurgated version. Well, now, listen, it's interesting you should say that, because I had read that there was a scene where in a Tucson bar they sing Throw the Jew Down the Well. No, that's a scene from, he, he okay. ran that scene on his TV show. Well, that wasn't in the movie I saw. Okay, that wasn't, okay. In, any, that wasn't in any movie. It's all becoming clear. Um, but, 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 you know, I, I may be such a, a Hollywood insider that I saw an early version that they then tinkered with before they released it. I doubt that. There was not a bit. The car dealer scene went on for a while. You would remember it. Huh. Weird. And you would definitely remember the theme of that. Believe you me. And I won't say any more about that. The theme was sex. I take it the theme was cars and sex. You might say. Um, okay. Well, I remember the bear. <laughs> so I'm surprised PETA hasn't had, a, had its say on this movie. Final thing I'll say is, you know, he is quite... Talented. He, he's a very he's a very kind of good uh, improvisational mimic. But the truth is, if you want to know why he's world famous, I mean, I'll bet there's a hundred comedians who are as good at, at improvisational mimicry. What the key, the key added ingredient he's got is his sheer brazenness, his willingness to like put people on like that. And sometimes I do think it amounts to a kind of cruelty. Um, at the dinner table when he says that thing to the minister and, and his wife and, you know, causes them true pain on the spot, unflinching, has no trouble doing it. And, and at other times, he knows full well he's going to be causing people pain afterwards. And so the secret to his success really is, I think, a kind of moral coarseness in, in that sense. I thought the dinner table scene, that, I didn't like that scene. That was, that was the only one that, that seemed to fit that bill. Even, even the Bob Barr scene was sort of, it's nothing Bob Bars should lose sleep over. I mean, anybody would have the reaction he had. It's, it happens that Bob Barr is sort of the perfect choice. For <laughs> Another guy who's not a rube, though, even though he's a red state guy. Barr. Yeah. I know nothing about him. I know he's a civil lawyer. Well, I just mean he's not an uneducated... You know, it's, he's, he's not in keeping with the David Brooks thesis. Um, so, I don't know. Whoa, we've gone on a long time about that. But it was a big cultural event. Do you have anything else to say about it? No, I don't. 
I feel as if I should. I mean, there is a fundamental level at which I don't approve of, 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 a, of a lot of what he did, and I feel I haven't made that clear enough, while at the same time admitting that I laughed at a lot of it. I think you've got that point across. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> thumbs down from Bob. Well, um, in one sense, yes. Morally, yes. Yes. Um, okay. I would ring the bell if I had the bell. Oh, you haven't done that in so long. The, the bell and the moose have been on a long vacation. Here's um, the bell. Maybe they're together. The, uh, I, yeah, this McCain thing. Yesterday was kind of uh, McCain Day on TV. Did you see any of these various news shows on which he was celebrated? I saw the Chris Matthews show, which was a love fest. It really was. And, and, uh, and then he was also on the ABC This Week. He was interviewed on that. And then afterwards, you know, George Will uh, did a little... Well, all, all Will said was that it was, it was true leadership to, to advocate this position that's electorally unpopular and for good reason. But wait a second. Wait, wait, wait. This is my big beef, is that McCain I, is getting free ride, uh, a free ride on this claim that he is the candidate of principle. This was repeated both by David Brooks on uh, Chris Matthews and, uh, and, as you said, George Will. And I don't think it holds up to scrutiny. Want to know why? Yes. I'm, okay. On tenor hooks. For starters, the, the David, we might as well make this David Brooks bashing day. The, uh, the da David Brooks, first of all, lavishes praise on him for being the candidate of principle, the one who will tell it like it is, blah, blah, blah. Then they get into his, his relation to religious conservatives. And Brooks says, well, there is a danger that, that you know, his true feelings about these issues will <laughs> bubble up again, uh, as they did several years ago in South Carolina. Well, wait a second. If his honest opinions about an important range of issues he, he manages to suppress for years at a time, is that what we mean by a candidate of principle who's, who's unflinchingly willing to tell it like it is? Very good point. Thank you. Not a, not, point, that ha not a point that hasn't been made elsewhere, but yes. Well, maybe, but it was not made on the Chris Matthews show. You did not see that contradiction unveiled on the MSM yesterday. You've got to tune into Blogging Heads TV for that. Well, the, Chris, the Chris Matthews it was a har harmonic convergence of A... McCain brings viewers. Okay, he's incredibly popular on television. You know, he even brings hits to websites. If you mention, there was a time in in the 2000 campaign where if you mentioned John McCain, your 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 hits would go through the roof. Um, uh, second, Matthews obviously himself loves McCain, and he had four reporters who loved McCain. Yeah. So it was it was ridiculous. No, it, it's, uh, you know, as you know, I mean, McCain, McCain worries me. And as you know, I'm trying to stigmatize him as the candidate of the neocons, which he certainly was last time around. He was deemed guy most likely to invade Iraq. Um, the, the, um, was he the guy most likely to invade Iraq? He was the guy most likely to want to... I'm somewhat oversimplifying the neocon attachment to him. This was, this was before 9-11. But the uh, guy most willing to do that kind of thing, you know, the, the, go around the, American weight yeah. recklessly. I was, of course, annoyed by David Brooks, who is the focus of evil in the modern world, it turns out, uh, when he said there is no conservative agenda left. Uh, uh, well, what about immigration, David? I mean, he happens to ignore the part of the conservative agenda that he doesn't like and that John McCain doesn't like. And then I think will ultimately prove to be McCain's undoing. Wait, can I pause? We'll get back to McCain. Can I pause to chide you a little? It seems to me, I mean, you were saying that you your, your version of immigration is a winning issue, but that didn't turn out that way for the Republicans, right, in the election? Well, I'm working on a longer piece on this. Okay, Bob, we'll let you get back to that. But, but the last I heard is that now that the real battleground for, the, for, for partisan dominance nationwide is going to be the Southwest, and, la and, and according to this last election, uh, you better, it, it, the party that wants to win there, Better, better win the Hispanic vote, which means you better not listen to Mickey Cows. But we'll well, unless th that's not quite true, unless um, in the future that's true, certainly, but not necessarily the next election. The Hispanic vote still is not a, is not overwhelming in those, even in those areas. You're trying to uh, keep it from becoming true, true by building what a wall. What, didn't, what, what, what did not happen that I sort of half expected to happen was that the immigration issue saves Republicans who would otherwise be swamped by the war issue. Uh, the, you know, there are a couple of people like J.D. Hayworth who who lost by a very small margin, but you, it, 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 uh, I suspected that uh, that his his very very extreme immigration position would save him. I mean, he's for deportation. He's way beyond anything I would support. Um, and, but and it did. So that didn't happen. 
but it's, it's not completely clear that the immigration issue hurt. Uh, it certainly helped Brian Bilbray in San Diego. Uh, you know, it, okay. I await, I await a bunch of analysis of the Republicans who survived uh, and did immigration help them. Plus, you know, it was not only swamped by Iraq, but the Democrats aped the Republican position, so they, they sort of they sort of matched the Republican Republicans on uh, uh, on immigration, on being conservative, so so they neutralized that issue. Okay. But basically it was all swamped by Iraq. Okay. My bad for mentioning the word immigration in your presence. Sorry. Can we get back to McCain? Well, you're not going to... Ch- I don't like that scolding tone in your voice. You started this I'm making interesting you know hand gestures to go along with it. You'll be happy to find out. You made what? I'm making interesting hand gestures to go along with it. But no eye rolling, I hope. No, I think I avoided that successfully. Okay, well, I can't wait to see these hand gestures. But, uh, yes, we can get back to McCain. But, anyway, I, I guess McC- the hope for McCain would be that immigration gets done quickly this year in time for the Republican electorate to forget forget it by the time he's he's running for the nomination. That would be one hope. Briefly, on the, on the George Will Lodge McCain front, uh, which happened on ABC, his his... His illustration of McCain being a man of principle was that, you know, he's he's the only one calling for a big increase in in troop strength in Iraq as, as, a, as an illustration of how he stands by principle. Now, it's true that that has been his position for a while. I don't think he arrived at it opportunistically. But let's not ignore the fact that it is the most politically convenient position he could have at this point, certainly that a, that a major hawk could have, because... That is the one thing that's almost certain not to happen, so he will always be able to say, well, if you had done what I said. I mean, I mean, the object of the game politically for everyone in Iraq at this point is to embrace something, embrace a strategy that is not going to be adopted by the United States, right? And then they can say, well, if you had done it my way, it would have worked out. Uh, so, you know, Will is just a little naive in putting it that way. I mean... I'm happy to say that on the McLaughlin group, everybody made this point, that, that, that McCain is sitting pretty politically by virtue of this position. But well, it's a very good point. Also, that's his, his big selling point to the Republican primary electorate is that he's hawkish on Iraq. That, you know, why, otherwise, why, why would you want McCain if, 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 if he's just going to withdraw from Iraq like everybody else? What's the point? The only point of electing McCain is he's electable and he will preserve the Bush effort in Iraq. And elsewhere. That, that will not Hello? be the only place we invade, I suspect, if he becomes it's not, president. It's, I, 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 you know, I think it's possible that the, the, the desire to preserve the Bush foreign policy will be restricted to about 12 percent of even the Republican electorate by the time those primaries roll around. So I don't know how much of a big selling point it's going to be for McCain. You know, uh, they talked uh, about his anger problem yesterday. Yeah. What do you think of the thesis that many of his policy positions begin as fits of anger that he then sticks with? Well, so do many of my policy positions. Well, exactly. Well, so what's so this is a two that? for critique. I'm just asking if you think that's plausible. If so, I'll try to get that meme uh, rolling at some point. It's plausible that that's true. It's not, I, I, don't, I, I, I deny that that's, uh, that that's a terrible indictment of him. I mean, you, you think policies should basically begin as fits of anger, and then whatever comes out of your mouth when you're mad, you should uh, write into legislation? No, but then you, refi- you, you if you base it on genuine passion and a sense of injustice, if you, if you, if you see, you know, if you're in Barcelona and you see a rich man eating a, a fancy meal while a beggar is starving outside, and you... Did like Orwell George do that Orwell, or something? Like George Orwell, you decide... This reinforces your belief in socialism. I don't. What's so terrible about that? But you now think Orwell was wrong, right? About what? Socialism. Well, I, I you know, or er, Orwell would think Orwell was wrong about socialism, but, uh, but you know, but, but he was he was right about people shouldn't be starving. We agree. Okay, so, so we've reached um, consensus on that issue. But um, but anyway. Hey, aside from all his insane, aside from all his misguided positions, I would like McCain. I, mean, I, was, a, <laughs> I was a McCain person. He's a little like Ernest Hollings, uh, who you literally were a person for. You were on the staff of well, Fritz Hollings, for him, but it, he was a great guy, except for his wrong positions and all sorts of issues. And a somewhat crude nationalism in the end, I think. 
No, he well, he was a genuine protectionist in the end throughout. Right. He was always a protectionist. But he even made some kind of ethnically insensitive remarks in a nationalist cause, as I recall. Oh, they were, he was just harking back to the patriotism of World War II. Oh, but, uh, <laughs> I see. He basically was a, he, he's a good man who, who got all the big decisions right, and, and the, except for trade and, and most of the small decisions wrong. Is, was hiring you a big position or a small position? That was so tiny, it, it, he got it right. Didn't even qualify as wrong. Okay. And then he didn't use any of my speeches, which was probably also right. Now, on Iraq itself, should we... Yeah, I do well, think I've got Iraq figured out. You do? Well, not exactly. Well, but I, I do think, in, in, in a very broad-gauge way, I mean, I think it's gotten so bad... Uh, today's New York Times had this horrible story about how bad things have gotten. Militias come to funerals and offer to carry out revenge attacks. Gunmen execute blindfolded people in full public view. Mortars are lobbed between Sunni and Shiite neighborhoods. Sometimes the killers seem to be seeking specific people who were involved in earlier attacks, but many victims lose their lives simply to, excuse me, even out the sectarian toll. Um, I think stability is not going to return until Iraq has been part partitioned into more or less ethnically homogeneous political entities that have either autonomy or out-and-out -out sovereignty. I, I, I think at this point there's kind of no turning back. Uh, the, the, the problem, I mean, there are a lot of problems with that. One problem is there isn't, although there is a lot more geographic homogeneity of population now ethnically than there was six months ago because there's been so much ethnic cleansing. Right. Um, there's still not enough to make that an easy solution. So if you're going to be completely cold-bloodedly realist and, and amoral, if not immoral, about it, you would say, well, let the ethnic cleansing, you know, continue for three to six months, and then we'll have a map we can live with. One problem with that is that the longer it goes on, the more they hate each other, the, the, the less plausible even a kind of, uh, a kind of uh, federalist partition that, w that gives the provinces... Um, you know, autonomy but not sovereignty becomes, and you wind up actually having to divide it into, into a number of countries. Uh, but in any event, I think one way or another, that's what we're going to wind up with. Um, and uh, I actually can say one or two more things, but do you have problems with that so far? Uh, no, no, I was, I was heading toward uh, reading, this, reading similar stories. I was heading toward the conclusion that, it's, that partition is, is the both the inevitable and most desirable solution, and you know that it's looking a lot like Yugoslavia. I mean, sort of. Yeah. What will happen there is what happened in Yugoslavia, and uh, and you know, but clearly the situation in Yugoslavia is better now than a full-scale civil war. I mean, yes, they yeah, no, I they, they still kill each other, but they but it's all tamped down. I've always thought there was something to be said for partition. I mean, I think it was almost three years ago that I wrote my slate piece suggesting partition. In Iraq, along right. with my little, remember my little rolling elections idea? Um, yes. But, but back then, the but, idea was that sectarian tensions were not so high that you couldn't have minority rights respected within, you know, somewhat heterogeneous provinces. That was the idea then. Now I think that's just about hopeless. Um, but, but, and so we'll go the ahead. other problem is that the Shiites seem to want as much territory as possible. That is why they issued that order in Diyala to to arrest all the the the, uh, the good Sunni leaders. Yeah. Uh, because they basically want to, you know, it's one of the a disputed province they want control of. So uh, there's a all those issues would have to be ironed out. And but can't you uh, can't you sort of have a have a controlled partition where one of the functions of our troops is to sort of usher various groups of refugees across border lines and. I don't know. How did the partition of India and Pakistan happen? Was that incredibly violent and bloody? Well, it was violent. Uh, I don't know when they. I don't know when it came to a halt. Um, it came to a halt in less than complete fashion. There were a lot of Muslims in, in no, India. No, I know, but uh, but I, I, my impression is that there wasn't. It wasn't. There were huge refugee flows, but I don't think there was. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know, but I, I do think maybe recognizing that that's where we're headed, which I fear the, ba the Baker Commission is not going to recognize, is probably a prerequisite for, you know, a less than disastrous outcome. And, but, you know, and, and then the object of the game will be, I mean, I mean, one complaint you hear about that is, wait a second, the Sunnis 
have no oil on their land, okay, well, in a way, that's an opportunity. I mean, it, it, it you know, th th that is, first of all, a problem that could only be solved in the most straightforward fashion in a federalist system where there was enough kind of supra-provincial governance to, uh, you know, transfer oil revenue systematically from, from Shiite areas to Sunni, uh, to Sunni hands, you know, so that there was some divvying up of the national oil resources. I'm saying I don't even think that degree of coherence, of national coherence, right, right, right. is in the cards. But, but um, that is in a way a blessing, because the, the, the biggest threat probably to America's security will lie in the Sunni regions. I think we're going to ultimately just basically have to let the Shiites do, you know, what they do, and, and we won't be able to insist it's democratic or anything else. We'll, we'll, we'll have to hope uh, that it not, you know, have any big terrorist camps. Where it, and, and, and in the Sunni area, there, there are likely to be big terrorist camps if we're not careful. And there, I think you want to somehow leverage the fact that they will not be very economically self-sufficient because well, of the lack of oil. They'll get funding from states from sympathizers in states that have oil. Well, right, but you try to make those your allies. You try to exert as much influence over that as you can, maybe provide some of it directly, maybe some through the U.N., but the point is it's the need for economic aid that you try to use as a lever to make sure that they do not have big swaths of land devoted to terrorist training camps. Yeah. A couple of points. First, I, too, am amazed that the Baker Commission has, has thrown this out the window. I'm also amazed at the Tom Rick story in the Washington Post today about the three options the Pentagon is considering, none of which involve partition. And the main one, you know, it's a standard thing where they, they have two extreme options, so you have to pick the one in the middle. The one in the middle, which is neither, you know, heavy up the forces or pull out, but sort of a, a sort of half-ass stay the course thing involves, uh, you know, building up the forces so we con the Iraqis into thinking we're going to stay, and then we quickly bug out before they realize. Uh, it, 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 it seems doomed. It relies on building up the, the very forces that are being infiltrated by the sectarians. Uh, it, it seems much worse than, than uh, you know, than, than, than the partition option, or much less less likely to succeed. And, but the other interesting option is, you know, we have a civil war. You know, one solution is to side with one side or the other, and the interesting side to side with is the Shiites. What would happen if we just said, okay, we got to pick a side? We pick the Shiites. Uh, and that gives us some leverage. That's a goodie we're doing for Iran. So in terms of negotiating with Iran, that's a possible basis for cooperation is, you know, you get this thing where, where we, we basically side with your guys in Iraq uh, in exchange for what? I don't know. Yeah, but uh, wouldn't it also, meanwhile, empower the fundamentalists uh, within the Sunni area? I guess you mean because you mean because they're the only people who could take up arms against the Shiites. Well, it just it just the, the more we if we if we systematically oppose the Sunnis, it seems to work on the on the favor on the side of uh, religious you know fervor in the Sunni territory, and so plays into the hands of the fundamentalist terrorists, and that's exactly what we don't want is them winding up with the upper hand in the Sunni area. No, I guess that's right, and. and uh, that would be a downside. <laughs> they, they might wind up with the upper hand anyway. I mean, you know, the most violent people tend to win out. And the well, the, the Baathists are, are not known for their reticence, as I recall. The Very secular Baathists. Point. Very good point. The, um, but, but I'm thinking whether, whether, whether this partition solution might actually have some, so, some of the benefits of siding with the Shiites without some of the downsides. In other words, we could say, we're for partition. Yes, you're going to end up with most of the oil money. May, you know, at the same time, our presence is going to ensure that you don't persecute the Sunnis so much that you know that 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 they have legitimate grounds for being incredibly violent. Yeah, I don't uh, know, and I don't and I don't have a clear idea of the transitional picture. Like, do we have troops in along the border in Sunni areas protecting Sunnis, or I, I just don't I don't have a clear idea. But well, there are a lot of areas where we are obviously protecting Sunnis, including that province that the New York Times wrote yeah. about, Diyala. No, there are. Um, but but sometimes we do things on behalf of Shiites. I, I, I don't know. It, it just does seem to me that, that, that the administration and people in Washington need to get realistic. I don't see anything short of partition stabilizing this place at this yeah. point. And the other thing, in terms of, in terms of uh, defunding the terrorists, I mean, I think Tom Friedman's idea is becoming more and more appealing of you have to do something to lower the price of oil. Oh yeah, and, and some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of non, 
non-free market uh, tax on, you know, externally based tax on gasoline or yeah. requirement of more energy efficiency is, is, is clearly a powerful weapon. If, if, we're, if what we're relying on is that the al-Qaeda people who control this province won't, won't have a lot of funds, uh, that's sort of a crude but effective technique. Yeah. Um, I know. I certainly agree on the oil, the, uh, oil point. Um, I mean, he, he says it's like welfare, and since you know. Well, oil. Uh, you know, having an economy that's dependent me. on the the natural resource of oil just tends to be a curse for almost all countries. It's true of, and the lower the price of oil, the less a curse it is for those countries. First of all, uh, you know, the more it'll force them to to get with the picture and and get you know uh, economically and, and develop economically. Right. Um, it's been terrible for our interests and for the interests of the people of those countries, I think. And, it, you know, oil is conducive to authoritarianism and everything else. It's bad. Um, but and I noticed uh, the other thing that was interesting was that, you know, that there's been this talk of let's make one big final effort before we give up. And Fareed Zakari, who had actually proposed that two weeks ago, abandoned it on ABC. Yeah, he was sounding kind of downcast about the whole thing. <laughs> uh, and the... the, the the other, the other point is that they're all saying it's in the interest of both parties that the war be over by 2008. Well, that, isn't that impossible? It can't be in the interest of both parties. Yeah, I, 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 I had exactly the same thought. The person who said that, or the person who affirmed it, was George Will. Right. And I had exactly the same thought. It's a zero-sum game. Barring a third party, that's a ridiculous statement. It's a, uh, because if there's not a third party, it's a zero-sum game between the Republicans and Democrats. Yeah, it could be in the interest of individual candidates within the party, but in terms of winning the White House, one party is wrong. One, it's in one party's interest more than the other. To Mickey, have. it kind of makes you wonder why millions of people watch them and, at best, thousands watch us. Well, that's all going to change. Yeah, I feel the change. Um, you want to change subjects? Yes. Um, we were going to talk about Pelosi? Uh, yes. Uh, are we? Yeah. We are going to talk about Pelosi. Uh, there was this, there was this uh, Marine Dowd column where she writes critically of Pelosi. Women get criticized in the office for acting on relationships and past slights rather than strategy, so Madam Speaker wasted no time making her first move based on relationships and past slights rather than strategy. Well, Mickey, being an evolutionary psychology buff, I, of course, immediately asked myself, you know, when I hear a gender stereotype, I ask myself whether there could be a genetic basis for it. Right. And it seemed I remembered something along these lines from a book that uh, Franz de Waal wrote, which is lying around here, which I'm about to get. Excuse me a second. Chimpanzee politics? Uh, no, it was, his, uh, it was a follow-up book called Peacemaking uh, Among Primates. Okay. Um, and uh, he now, first of all, he made some observations about chimpanzees. And before I get into those, I should stress that although chimpanzees are our nearest relatives, you know, there are straightforward extrapolation uh, from one species to the other would be naive. It's been six million years since we diverged from them, and certainly the last million years of both of our evolutions have been under very different social circumstances and so on, and also we're smarter, you know? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Full Having said ahead. that, <laughs> let me engage in uh, some uh, ratings-boosting uh, speculation. Um no, it's what, what DeWall wrote was that uh, in chimpanzees, first of all, males, I mean, they both have more conflicts, but also a much higher or a higher percentage of their conflicts are followed by reconciliation rituals than females, okay? Um, I mean, and of what? course, Pelosi's failure to reconcile with Steny Hoyer seemed to have something to do with this. She went to his party. She did? You mean after, you mean after all this? Briefly. Well, right, but it was before this. I mean, the question is, why did she oppose him in the first oh, place? Okay, okay. Failure yeah, okay. to reconcile was considered right, to be right, 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 right. Okay. One reason, DeWall writes, adult male chimpanzees seem to live in a hierarchical world with replaceable coalition partners and a single permanent goal, power. Uh, and, and, and that's the key, replaceable coalition partners. I mean, the observation is that the males pursue social status, first of all, more fiercely, certainly in the case of chimpanzees, but also right. more opportunistically. They will do any coalition shifting that's necessary. And but why is it in the w interest of the females not to be opportunistic? That's well, what I don't well one reason that I mean, in the chimpanzees, I mean, one reason I'm reluctant to extrapolate is you don't have the kind of clear theoretical 
uh, basis for for the expectation that you have in the case of some other sex differences, like sex differences in and the nature of jealousy, for example. But but first, let me. I mean, DeWall speculates a little about a human parallel, and then he quotes this Dutch swimming coach, this woman, who said, quote, I would rather see boys, so to speak, punch each other in the face when they disagree and drink a beer together one hour afterward than girls who may maintain a particular discord for months. Um, so it's totally speculative on DeWall's part. He's not putting that much stake in it. But I would say that, uh, you know, if there's an explanation, if, if A, the difference is, if there's a difference, if there's a genetic basis for this stereotype, it probably has something to do with the fact that males pursue social status more fiercely and single-mindedly to begin with. That's more the case in chimps than in humans, but I do think it's the case uh, in humans for reasons we more or less understand. I mean, I can't believe there's not a theoretical. I mean, I, there must be a, a theoretical, uh, something you can... A just so story you can come up with to, to explain the difference. I mean, well, women are. Well, no, I mean, the tied, difference, I mean, part of it is. Women are tied to their kids. They can't be as opportunistic as men who can always go have another family somewhere else. Well, part of it is social status per se is the goal of males because it seems to have been more highly correlated with reproductive success in males than in females. That's at least the theory with humans. Uh, it's pretty clearly the case in chimpanzees, um, and it's plausibly the case with humans. So, in, in that logic, males would be w willing to do anything to maintain and hold on to their social to hold on to their social status or achieve it. Okay, and if that and that includes, you know, uh, abandoning a friend, so be it. That's that's the argument. Whereas, with w the argument would be with women, uh, you know, I don't know. Well, first of all, they just don't have quite that degree of motivation. Uh, but as I said, the theoretical basis is not that clear to me. But I would say that to the extent that, that it's the case that there's this genetic difference and that it has something to do with the more single-minded pursuit of status by males, it's not clear to me that on balance you really want males to be the politicians as opposed to females. I mean, in this case, there was what I would call a political screw-up based on, on an insufficiently opportunistic approach to coalition building. But I would also say that if you look at what, got, what, what led us into Iraq, it was kind of classically male behavior associated with the pursuit of status. Um, oh, don't be silly. It was Pelosi-like behavior. It was, uh, you know, at least according to, to some people, it was Bush holding a, a mafia-like grudge against Hussein. Uh, for trying to kill his daddy. That's one. That's one theory, but of course, well, yeah. I, I mean, that's one theory. That's one of many things people think I it mean, could it have could, been. You know, there, there it, are like it, a thousand influences floating right, around in this could, administration. It could be Pelosi-like or it could be un-Pelosi-like, but it certainly wasn't clearly sort of opportunistic male status. No, but here's what I'm saying: is is some of the features associated with male psychology in this view? Okay where status is everything, is, you know, they're, A, unwilling to admit they've made a mistake. And this is totally another, another stereotype about men and women that I think may have a genetic basis. Uh, they're more reluctant to seek guidance in, in the sense of asking for directions and stuff. They're more reluctant to admit mistakes. Um, and certainly, if early on, a month after Iraq, uh, Don Rumsfeld and George Bush had, had, had been willing to say, wait a second, maybe we made some fundamental mistakes in the way we approached this and how many people we had. That would have been nice. That might have led to a different outcome. The other thing is that if you look at how we got into the war in the first place, um, there was this point beyond which a bunch of men, Democrats and Republicans, you, you heard this from men saying, well, now that the troops are over there, we really have to invade because otherwise we would, like, lose face or something, right? I mean, even though, much to our surprise, after we got the troops over there, they let in the U.N. inspectors and they were allowed to go anywhere they wanted, we, we felt we still uh, had to invade. I mean, I remember Wesley Clark saying, well, now that we've got the troops over there, you really got to invade. I mean, that, I in this view, is, is kind of classically male behavior, an inability to kind of reverse course and suggest, you know, and also the inability to look as if, Somebody has outsmarted or stymied you, and the fear was that. Well, then, are you, are you saying, are you saying, a, a, a woman, i.e., Pelosi, would be is more reluctant to admit her mistakes? I haven't seen her admitting any mistakes at all. In fact, you know, the logical thing for her to do 
would have been to say, look, you know, I miscalculated. I'm out of touch with my caucus. I pledged to listen more and go on a listening tour for a caucus. And she hasn't done any of that. Well, people in general are reluctant to admit mistakes, but you, you actually have gotten to what may be a fundamental flaw in the premise underlying this whole discussion. And I wanted to st save it for last so that we could at least have the ratings boosting discussion, you know, which is um, if it's true that, you know, the typical average male is more prone to seek status and political power than the typical average woman, right? Um, right. And first of all, of course, you have to say there's a lot of overlap in the population, and these are just, you know, averages. But still, if that's true, then the women who do enter politics may just be less typical women than the typical woman, right? So maybe all of these generalizations kind of tend to fall apart with the relatively small number of women who pursue a political career. That's possible. I mean, like Margaret Thatcher. Although, on the other hand, I'll say that Margaret Thatcher, I mean, one thing you might expect to see in women in cases like this is a greater willingness to stand by what they consider principle. Um, and, uh, and, you know, she was the one who, when, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, which is clearly, clearly a violation of international law and everything else. She's the one who said to George Bush, you know, one, the, the older one, you know, buck up, you know, do something about this. Otherwise, well, I mean, you probably wouldn't have. It was, that wasn't necessarily because it was a violation of international law. Well. But, uh, it, it, um, it, 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 you know, it may be that women and men have different ways of being politicians, and that, uh, but, you know, th throughout the country, there are women who are very effective uh, legislative leaders. So there's... I think Pelosi's problems are probably more sort of sui generis, and I mean, it, it is weird that every all the pieces about Pelosi that explain where she comes from all talk about her father, and it, you know, they all assume that she has inherited all her father's qualities, which I agree is a leap, especially since she's a different sex than her father and might have very different impulses than her father. It's all you know, well, you know. You know, her, her father knew that you threw a punch, you got to be able to take a punch. Well, where's the evidence that she can take a punch? Uh, she seemed, you know, the, fa the father was presumably not as vindictive as, as, as she is. Um, Maybe she overcompensates to prove. It's possible. My, my, my theory is that at the moment her very fragility, which is like this, this sense you have that, you know, she's about to crack at any minute, uh, is her source of power. And I've noticed this in some men, too. You're reluctant to challenge her at now because you think it'll, she'll totally collapse and it will be a disaster for the Democrats. Whereas a guy like Bill Clinton, he's this big, doughy guy, you could keep beat, beating up on him. You knew he'd never crack completely, so you could keep beating up on him. I think now nobody's going to beat up on her because she's about to, to crater. Uh, and, and, you know, one more problem or two more problems, and, and they'll have to dump her, and they don't want to dump the first female Speaker of the House. So, so it's like Kim Jong-il or... It's, it's exactly like the thing that uh, Henry Farrell said about Kim Jong-il or Nouri al-Maliki, which is their, their weakness is their strength at this point. And part of that, I think, may have to do with the fact that she's a woman. I mean, people sort of assume she's closer to the breaking point than, than Clinton would, would be. Um, well, Steny Hoyer was on one of the Sunday shows. I thought he was, you know, he seemed reasonably competent. I thought, you know. He was competent. He's sort of stunningly honest. He's, I mean, he, for, well, he, for, was, he was evasive when he needed to be evasive. But, and he was clever, like on the, on, the, on the Jane Harmon issue, you know, who's going to head this intelligence committee. He's like, well, that's, well, that's the speaker's honest, decision, and I'll only give her my opinion in private, you know. But he basically gave a strong hit what his opinion was in a way that, uh, that a, a slicker, you know, that I expected him to be more, more sort of frist-like or, or, you know, just opaque and, you know, just not give away anything. And he basically, he basically gave you a good idea that he thinks Harmon should get the job. Um, don't you think? He said nice things about Hastings, but he did not mention the compromise candidate. Right, no. Um, the, we, we had a reader who had an interesting theory that I think was wrong about why Pelosi doesn't like Harmon, which is, that both Harmon uh, and Hoyer are too close to AIPAC and the, and the Israel lobby. Uh, and it's a nice theory, except that Pelosi is also very close to the Israel lobby. I looked it up. So I think reader Denville Steve is wrong about that. Okay. But and that reader should feel uh, reprimanded.
No. No, we encourage. We it encourage. Was inter- uh, it was an interesting theory. I just don't think. I just don't think it's right. I, 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 th- I think, you know, it, it would be interesting if, if Pelosi's dispute with Harmon was ideological as opposed to personal. Uh, but I think it's more personal. I suspect it is. Um, Mickey, uh, if we're about done with Pelosi. Yeah, we got to move. The gas yeah, man's coming. Yeah, yeah, okay. Can you just remind me never to write a book for Judith Regan, okay? Because it's like... Did you try at one point? I didn't try, but, I mean, she's out there. She's an editor, and, you know... You know, when you've got a book coming out, it's like a big deal, and you're worried about it. You call your your editor for like reassurance and consolation. You say, "How's the buzz?" And they say, "Oh, the the buzz is good. People are saying good things, you know." And we think it'll be widely reviewed and stuff. So, they're like, if you turn on the TV and you see your editor, that's good news because they're going to like help spread the buzz. And then you see the editor saying, the editor of your book saying, you know, this book proves that the author is a liar and a murderer. It would just take the wind out of your sails. Well, but that is the buzz. Presumably she's doing that because you you think that's hurting sales? I I don't know, but if I were the author, that wouldn't be the only thought that occurred to me. That would just take some of the joie de vivre out of the book tour. Well, but if you were the author, you would write a book saying, if I had killed my wife. You Um, you have pointed to an important distinction between me and O.J. Simpson. Plus, I haven't killed my wife. That's two things. I I I have two things. I have two things to say. First... You know, if she actually gets some damning details that that's help resolve this mystery, and there's still parts of the crime, a lot of the crime, that nobody knows what the heck went on, uh, then she will have done a service, you know. Uh, so so let's see what, uh, you know, according to uh, Newsweek, there's only one chapter in the book that deals with the crime. It all sounds like they're a con job where they're, they're, they're selling... What's not going to amount to much. The other. The that other sounds a angle, ridiculous premise for a book to me. I, I. Why would anyone even. I don't know, but go ahead. Well, apparently, according to Regan, and I, I'm not sure that it's wrong, is that when killers confess, often it's in the hypothetical. That that's the first step toward confessing. Fascinating well, she, premise. She goes on and on about confession and penance and contrition, and obviously OJ is going to have, show none of that. So, I mean, that part of her defense is bogus. But, but well, the fact that it might have some some truth, some mystery-resolving power, it seems to me that's possible. And the second thing is a lot – I know veteran crime reporters or a veteran crime reporter who went to the trial and thought the jury's verdict was, was right, shockingly. I wrote the piece that said the jury's verdict was right based on the evidence as presented. In, in, uh, it was a TRB for the New Republic. Huh. Well, there you go. You were right. No, the evidence was corrupted, and, 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 and jurors in L.A., especially black jurors, given the history of the L.A. Police Department, had reason to have grave doubts. Look, Detective Van Adder, Mickey, not to dredge this up, but <laughs> when they brought Simpson into the, into the police headquarters and took his blood sample when he was a suspect, you know, you're supposed to book that evidence right at police headquarters? Detective Van Adder puts it in the glove compartment of his car and drives to the scene of the crime. And later they found Simpson's blood there. Now... If you're an already suspicious juror, that kind of throws into question, you know, the whole thing. No. Uh, th- but, Inexcusable but, but, com- incompetence. But, but also a lot of reporters think that there is a, a major aspect of the crime that was overlooked, that there may have been other people involved uh, that we never knew about. Mm. Uh, and and uh, so uh, it's... Uh, it, I think if you had two people, you'd do a much cleaner job of it than that. There were other problems with the prosecution, but but we. Well, I have, I, I can't say more for for fear of libeling people. So. But, I I uh, can't say more for for uh, fear of further antagonizing a constituency I've already antagonized in this show. Um. Uh, humanity, women. Uh, maybe feminists. I mean, I I thought the, the the prosecution. Well, I guess I'm headed here, aren't I? The prosecution. What was the name of the lead prosecutor? Marsha Clark. Yeah, you haven't forgotten. Did you have a crush on Marcia? No, I knew somebody who ghost read her book. Oh. Um, it was a feminist theory of the crime, which is that he came there to kill the wife, but then this it so happened that Ron Goldman happened upon the scene. Well, that's a hell of a coincidence that the moment you're killing your wife, some guy not rings the door, you know, come I mean, that's quite a coincidence. Much more likely, less feminist theory, but but I would say more consistent with male psychology is that the first guy he wanted to kill was the male rival. 
So that's Chris. That's the Chris Rock theory. Here's this guy. He's screwing O.J.'s woman and driving around in the Ferrari that O.J. bought for his yeah, wife. Yeah, he wants to kill him. Of course, he waits in the bushes. <laughs> the guy walks up on the doorstep. He starts killing him, and and she comes out and he kills her too. The the but the, but the whole theory presented by the prosecution was not that. So anyway, okay. but also Marcia Clarkberry thought she could rely on her rapport with black female jurors, and the re- rapport somehow was insufficient to to overcome other factors. Apparently, uh, um, so um, well anyway, I, I I jump on the bandwagon of condemnation for uh, Judith Regan. I the only you know she's revolting, and her whole I publishing history is largely revolting. One thing I'd say in her defense, you know, she has said. But wait a second, when Barbara Walters reviews, interviews so-and-so, you don't complain. The one thing I'll say in her defense is, it is a little hard these days to, to know where the line is between acceptable outrage and unacceptable outrage, right? But I we now know that she's on the wrong side of the line. I wouldn't jump on the bandwagon. I mean, she's sort of a, 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 a toxic person. But, uh, but like I say, if, if, you know, if giving OJ, OJ's children a million dollars... You know, produces the truth. That would be worth it. I don't think it will. But I didn't even buy her story that that's where the money's going. Uh, well, it sort of doesn't really matter at some point, right? Um, now, Mickey, is it is it uh, true as you suggested in an email that you have some political gossip thanks to your uh, habit of hobnobbing with political elites? Yes, Bob, I do. But that's all I know. That's all you said in your email. Let's hear it. I have, I, I, I I I went to the East Coast and I've been to you know I unaccustomedly got out and actually mingled with other human beings. And I have two items of gossip. One is that my, very disappointing that my candidate, Ed Rendell, governor of Pennsylvania, recently won re-election by a big margin. Key state, candid, competent Democrat is not going to run for president. He wants to be Secretary of Energy. So sad. He wants to be Secretary of Energy? Such limited ambitions. Such Energy's un- big. Un- unfulfilled male primate possibilities. I share uh, your sense of loss. Anything else? Uh, and the other thing the other thing people were talking about is that th- there's renewed speculation that John Warner did not drop out of the race entirely to spend more time with his family, as he said at the John time. John Warner or Mark and Warner? Mark Warner, sorry. Mark Warner. Former governor of Virginia. What, is there a scandal in his closet? It, the, what I heard was that it barely even amounted to a scandal, but it was that it was you know that 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 somebody had, had developed an opposition file on him and said, look, if you run, this is going to be thrown at you, and you don't want this, do you? But what I heard was not much; it was not even very scandalous. So, uh, but you heard more than you've told us. Yes, Mickey. But not that much. No, I don't want to. I don't want to. Don't tease us, Mickey. I am teasing you. I urge renewed. Journalistic scrutiny in that area, and I think we'll see some more involved. How about a bipartisan did, commission? Why did Mark Warner drop? How out? about a bipartisan commission, Mickey? As long what? as you're recommending like really useful things instead of giving us the facts. What is what is the point of this ridicule, Bob? Well, you just kind of like whetted my appetite there. Well, it's a gossip. It's a teaser. Can we play ten, twenty questions? Like the nature of the scandalous material? Is it sexual? I, I, it was just not much. It was, it was I don't want to lie about Mark Warner. It was just not much. It, but um, the, uh, you know, I, I, we have journalistic standards here. Oh, even I on forgot. Blind head. Okay. It's not like anybody's watching, but we still try to maintain the fiction. Exactly. That, that we have standards. Okay, so we'll move so, on, or is there, do you have more gossip? No, I thought that was good gossip. That was great gossip. I just wish you had shared it with us. Okay. Um, no, that's it. But will something come out on this, you think? Can we expect, uh, can we turn, you know, to our paper every morning with uh, anticipation? I think something will come out of it. I don't think necessarily, you know, next week, but yes. Glad to hear it. <clears throat> now, in terms of housekeeping, Mickey, one, uh, one viewer has said uh, that the iPod video format did not work. If there's anyone for whom it did work, email us, but... Right my now, I'm assuming that he's r- right, and we're going to try to fix that, and maybe also even our beta work. testing of the iPod video yeah. format. Was that my brother? He said it didn't work. Did he? Yeah. Well, that would be two, and that would be, you know, critical mass, because I don't think it was your brother. He got some error message. Okay. 
I'll, I'll share that with our, our uh, vast technical staff. Um, I do, you know, encouragingly, Mickey, uh, when we lauded that, uh, that person who put a dingle link in his comments last week, that seems to have led to more dingle links. Uh, it also led to uh, uh, an email from Alice M. saying that actually she was putting dingle links in comments before this guy was, and so she deserves whatever prize you wind up giving him. But um, we never give any of these prizes anyway, so it's well, worse than Judith Regan in that respect. Well, I leave it in your capable hands. You're, you're the prize. You're the one with the prizes to give out. Not delivering. It might be a copy of the End of Equality. Yeah. That's what I had in mind. I don't know if that even qualifies as a Or a foot massage, whichever they would prefer. It's all between you and them. Um, um. The, uh, but anyway, it seems to me that if the, if the dingle links keep proliferating in the comment section, the time may not be far off and we can have like a dingle link of the week. You know? That would be pretty exciting. That would be. And I think the, the one, if I had to give the award this week, it would be to the one who... Uh, who caught me at a point when I raised my arm up and you could see this big swath of perspiration. Oh, Bob, why do you bring that up? Is it disgusting? Well, you where's your male primate sense of dignity? Dignity is not what I attribute to male primates. This was a humiliating moment in, in Bob Wright's life. <laughs> you think we shouldn't show the dingle link then? It was almost like the moment when I, like, pretend that, that I had developed a cloaking device, but you could see the bald top of my head. Yeah, but you've been, you've been a, a real trooper in terms of calling attention to these kinds of moments yourself, and I just thought I'd chip in and do it. If you think it's bad, I won't put it in the link. No, Should no, I not okay. do it? I just, I'm just looking after your interests, that's all. You think it's really bad? I, I, I thought it wasn't that bad. We can there talk after the show. I may put it in the links and I may not, but anyway. There was a noticeable sweat mark on your arm. I know. Well, not only that, but, but I saw it in the monitor when I did it. Live, I had the thought, oh, no, dingle links. Well, there you go. And, I, and I, I say that increasingly. Oh, no, Dingle Links. But um, anyway, in the future, if we do select Dingle Links of the Week, they will, they will not always be, you know, the kind of frat boy humor type of thing. So don't confine yourselves to, to uh, perspiration moments. It could even be where, where one of us makes a good point, although the embarrassing moments are likely to be more frequent. Mickey, email from uh, Seth Lipsky, the editor of the New York Sun, saying cool. that you're not the first person to uh, underestimate Gary Shapiro. Right. Apparently he delivered an extemporaneous graduation speech in Latin. At Harvard, right. According to a story that we think is not apocryphal. So there. It's a good story anyway. The translator couldn't translate it because it turned out he was talking spontaneously in Latin. Yeah. It's a smart guy. What a smart piece. He did. Plus and it was about us and it was... Just happened to be favorable. Uh, largely so. favorable, and we now have an excuse to link to it again. Um, oh, uh, quickly, Nate A. entered the words Dialogue and Dingle Link in Wikipedia, and they're there. We've cool. entered the lexicon, Mickey. Cool. Can't they be like, is, is it possible to veto something from Wikipedia? Well, apparently these, these had such weight that they were not, if that's possible. I don't know. Well, I think, I think the there's a way something can get voted down, yeah. The night is young. They could be voted down. But anyway. Well, we, uh, we encourage our viewers to go support them in whatever manner is possible. Um, and I guess that's all. I had this uh, email elaborately complaining about the color of the site, and I am curious about viewers' opinions of that. But I think we've gone on long enough, don't you? Uh, probably, yes. And the gas man is going to come any moment. Any moment. That's too, too uh, that that would have been a welcome I'm, and entertaining interruption. Show, I'm but... sorry that it didn't happen. Yeah, we, he, he, Should we just wait? Hour. Sorry? You want to wait? Just keep filming no, until he, he comes? Has, he has a five-hour window to show up. That could be a long this time. This is postmodern television, man. That would be great. It would be like, a, a, like Blog has me to Andy Warhol. Yeah. Exactly. Um, okay, well, I'll just go and we'll just like let the cameras keep running. Okay. Okay. Meanwhile, let's click these stop buttons. Okay. All right, see you around. See ya.